how I got into this. Uh, as Jean just remarked, I was general counsel of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, and while I was general counsel, it was not long after Nixon's uh, quasi-impeachment, uh, we received from the Office of Management and Budget, as every government agency, independent or not, regularly does, uh, some draft legislation on which they wanted our views. Uh, and this particular legislation was for the domestication of the executive privilege. And it said only the president, if it were going to be passed, it would say only the president could claim the executive privilege and he could only claim it for, quote, executive agencies, close quote, which the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, an independent regulatory commission with five commissioners uh, sitting uh, at its head. And so at some distance, but not complete distance, as I'll get to, um, from the White House, um, was, couldn't claim the executive privilege if this bill was enacted. And, we, you know, you can imagine, we had in our safes all kinds of stuff, uh, power plant plans, even some weapons stuff left over from the old AEC, that no president would want us to have to expose to some inquiring member of Congress. So we sent back a note saying, oh, you know, we don't generally have a problem with the way the statute works, but surely you want to include the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Look at all this stuff we have in our files, and probably other IRCs do too. And we got back a note from the Office of Management and Budget, or maybe it was the Office of Legal Counsel. So sad, too bad. You're not an executive agency, and you can't have executive privilege. And that really was the start of my life, if you like, as an academic worrying about a particular problem. Um, because it wasn't only that. I, I saw how much correspondence our chairman got from the White House and uh, how attentive he and the other commissioners were to it. They were much more attentive to messages coming from the White House uh, than they were to what might be going on in court for which my office was responsible. Uh, so um, that made me quite interested in what is the relationship between the president and governmental agencies. And a great deal of my scholarship since returning to Columbia has been about that. Um, and over a time in which the White House's, I'll call them pretensions, but other people call them just claims to authority, uh, over the activities of governmental agencies has been steadily growing. Uh, you read a lot about President Trump, and un perfectly understandably so, but he, he's not the sole cause of this. It begins at least in the Clinton administration. It's not hard to take it back to Reagan and even to Nixon uh, for uh, reasons that I will get to uh, uh, shortly. Um, it's, for me, quite a disturbing uh, development because what it says to the people who run agencies is that the president is in charge, that he has the responsibility, and when he tells them to do something, they are under an obligation to do it. They're if they're politically appointed, of course they feel a political obligation or may feel a political obligation to do it, but do they have a a legal obligation? Is he their commander? Uh, and that's basically the issue that I mean um, uh, to be talking to you about. Um, just what executive authority is, uh, is wrapped in mystery because the Constitution is quite unspecific. This is a couple of paragraphs often quoted from Justice Jackson's opinion in Youngstown Sheet and Tube versus Sawyer, which is the most, at least the most evident opinion in which our Supreme Court has gotten into the business of how much authority does the president himself have in relation to the activities of government. President Truman had attempted to seize the steel plants to protect defense production during the Korean War, uh, and Youngstown Shoot and Tube, uh, an opinion of the Supreme Court said, no, that wasn't a lawful act on his part. And Justice Jackson, for himself, Former Attorney General, uh, the Attorney General who had created the Lend-Lease Program for FDR, 
um, wrote a, an opinion for himself, which is by considerable margin the most cited of the opinions uh, in the case. And it opens in this way. I'll shortly be getting to uh, the way in which it closes, which for me is, is the most uh, momentous. Um, but uh, just what our forefathers did envision or would have envisioned had they foreseen modern conditions must be divined from materials almost as enigmatic as the dreams Joseph was called upon to interpret for Pharaoh. Uh, and that's not so far off. Um, so impeachment, very much uh, in the news. Uh, someone sent me this marvelous cartoon from the 1974 Washington or New Yorker. Um, but it um, may strike you as having a certain resonance with contemporary pronouncements. Um, and, and there are the limited provisions in the Constitution uh, on uh, impeachment. I'm not going to talk about it directly, but if, if some, something comes up in Q&A, uh, I'd be happy uh, to, uh, to do what I can. Um, there's one other part of the Constitution that could permit the removal of the president from office. That's the 25th Amendment. It gives the vice president and a majority of either the principal officers or some other body Congress may appoint, which it hasn't, uh, the authority to declare him incapacitated. This will work if the president is in a bad car accident. It is not going to work if the president is in control, more or less, in control of his senses. Uh, and uh, able, as soon as a loyalist in his cabinet tells him that, hey, this is going on, uh, is able to uh, fire everyone who might vote uh, for, his, uh, temporary, uh, for his temporary setting aside. So um, and now we get to the business of the day. Um, Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide. <laughs> oh, come on. Okay, what's the next slide? Uh, seven. No, I've got to do escape. No, no, no. There we go. And there is Article 2. And you'll notice it begins, well, I, actually, I've left, I shouldn't have. I've left out the first, <laughs> Section 1, which um, says executive power is vested in the President of the United States. And that's very clear. The folks who drafted the Constitution uh, had a choice to have a, a multiple executive a cabinet with real votes and some kind of control, or a single executive. And to produce responsibility, they chose a single executive. So the executive power is vested in the President of the United States. But what is that executive power, the uh, Pharaoh's dreams, uh, as Justice Jackson uh, referred to it? And Section 2 is actually the only section that says anything about the power of the president. And it says he's commander in chief of the army and navy. Well, that, that's pretty clear. He gives an order, you're under a legal obligation to obey it if you're in the army and navy. But it's the next clause, which in his opinion in Youngstown, Justice Jackson described as trivial, uh, that for me, 
but not for the originalists or other formal formalists, readers of the Constitution, is the most revealing. Um, he may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments upon any subject relating to the duties of their respective offices. Well, contrast that with commander-in-chief. I have the right to ask your opinion about how you're going to do what Congress gave you the power to do. Who, who has the power to do it? In the wording of that phrase? The administrator of the EPA, the Secretary of Labor, the Secretary of Transportation. Um, all I can do is ask you how, in, to tell me in writing, how you mean to do it. Oh, now of course, that's going to be back and forth. Uh, and uh, back and forth subject to the executive privilege by pretty easy implication. Uh, and whatever authority the president may have over my tenure in office is sitting there if he decides to use it. There'd be some political costs to pay for that, and we'll get into that in a moment. But as Strauss reads the Constitution, and I have to say to you, at the moment, I'm in a distinct minority. As Strauss means, reads the Constitution, that phrase says something. And so also Section 3, which provides a kind of interesting contrast, if you think about it, to parliamentary governments. And he shall from time to time give to the Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. So he gets to send Congress messages about what he wants Congress to do. If you know anything about parliamentary government, you know that in parliamentary government, when that happens, when the prime minister sends the parliament a message about some law that he wants adopted, that law gets adopted or else perhaps there's a new election. Uh-uh. Recommend their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient, and then it's up to them. And they pass it or they don't pass it, and he has no control over that, except if, he does, if they do something he doesn't like, he does have the veto. And then further on, he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Fine. That's a duty, not a power. And the responsibility is to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. It doesn't say <coughs> he shall faithfully execute the laws. It says he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Uh, by whom? by those people on whom Congress has conferred duties. Uh, and with such authority as he has over their continuing term in office and maybe over the money that he'll recommend to Congress that they should get for the work that they have to do and uh, a variety of other things of uh, that sort. So uh, here's... Does, does an acting, does an acting cabinet An acting, yes, and uh, you'll notice that, thank you for reminding me of this, that in this paragraph I've skipped over, uh, also there is some attention to, shall I put it, tension within executive government because he gets to nominate by and with the advice and consent of the Senate officers of the United States and the principal officers. It must be the people in charge. You have to get Senate confirmation, but not for actings. Okay, I'll, I'll get to that uh, in a bit. But that you have to get Senate confirmation entails, if you like, that during that process promises might be made about how I'm going to carry out the duties for which I'm now being appointed. And just as there may be political um, obligations to the president, there may be obligations of politics or honor 
or for that matter, future friendly, des the desirability of future friendly action to the legislature, to the Senate. And those of us who were around uh, during uh, the Saturday Night Massacre will remember to an attorney general and an acting attorney general who resigned because they had promised the Senate they would not fire Archibald Cox. And closer on, uh, the mother of uh, Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch, Ann Gorsuch, was Ronald Reagan's first appointment to the Environmental Protection Administration. And Ann Gorsuch um, was the Scott Pruitt of her time. She was a destructive force uh, in the EPA. And, but she was forced out of office for reasons we don't have to go into. And at that point, the only person Ronald Reagan could appoint to succeed her was William Ruckelshaus, who had been administrator of the EPA, the first administrator of the EPA during the Nixon administration. And although he was president of the Weyerhaeuser uh, Timber Company, he was known to be a committed environmentalist. Okay, well, Ronald Reagan, if he disapproved of something that William Ruckelshaus was doing, could have said, go home, Bill. But at what political cost to Ronald Reagan? And do we think William Ruckelshaus knew that and consequently had room to do what he thought was important to do for the environment within a framework that wasn't wholly controlled by the president's political preferences? Um, uh, for me, the answer to that question uh, is uh, pretty obvious. Yeah. So the, the conversation over the last couple of minutes basically been alluded to the fact that the, um, the cabinet members in charge of their particular departments, but from what it, uh, I might be misunderstanding, but you're saying that they don't answer to the president? Because in my understanding, by the, um, the checks and balances, is that the president is in charge of his cabinet, his other departments, and that um, if the president do something um, Well, and that is, has increasingly become the prevailing view of what the Constitution provides. There was at one point in the drafts of, of the constitutional text a sentence that would have said precisely that, that the president gets to decide. Um, that was dropped and uh, doesn't appear. What does appear is the language that I've shown you. And so the issue really is an issue about right. Does the president have the right to decide? And increasingly, that's the position that has been taken by presidents, and we'll see that that's the way in which they have organized their authority over a particularly important kind of thing uh, that the government does. But I don't think you can find that in the language that I'm showing you. What I think you can find in the language I'm showing you is that what the president has the right to do is to demand a written opinion about how you're going to do what Congress authorized you to do. That's what it says. And through the confirmation process, there, and for that matter, the obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, there's the possibility, at least, of legal room, if not political room, for those members of the cabinet to act. They are the ones with the legal responsibility. And in formal terms, at least, Presidents do recognize, generally do recognize that, but not exclusively. And I'll, I'll, I'll get in a couple of slides to some more on, uh, to some more about that. Yeah, Alan. Thank you. How is it decided whether a position requires Senate confirmation or not? For example, the EPA administrator requires Senate <coughs> The National Security Advisor does not require Senate confirmation. Okay, so to... Um, two kinds of responses to that. Um, officers of the United States 
but Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think property, proper in the president. So if you're not an inferior officer, if you're a principal officer, the Constitution says you have to be confirmed by the Senate, and there's your administrator of the EPA. There's no one between him and the president, so he's a principal officer. National security advisors are within the White House, within the executive office of the president. And wisely or not, Congress has given the president the right just to choose the people that he wants for the executive office of the president, with a, with a few exceptions. The administrator of the Office of Management and Budget has to be senatorially confirmed. The administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs has to be senatorially confirmed. But by and large, the folks whom during the Obama administration came to be called czars are in the executive office of the president, don't have to be confirmed. Oh, and it's better. It gets better than that. If you're the head of EPA and Congress asks you to come up for an oversight hearing, do you have to go? You're shaking your head yes, that's I think, correct. I think yes, okay. If you're a presidential advisor and Congress demands your presence, do you have to go? So these folks who are not subject to confirmation within the White House, who may be acquire the notion of being czars, are also free from congressional oversight. Who decides their budget? The Congress decides their budget, and Charles Black at one point uh, said to his students, a former, former colleague of ours, and, and, uh, but this was while he was at Yale, that Congress, if it could, if it, won't, if it wished to, could reduce the office of the president to a couple of appointment secretaries. <laughs> Uh, but Congress is now regularly appropriating something on the order of a billion dollars for the executive office of the president. Uh, and, um, you know, that, that could change. There hasn't been in any of the recent presidential administrations any inclination of uh, a um, disposition on the part of Congress to control the size of the executive so office of the presidency. No, no. They cut the budget of the executive office of the president, and the president controls how that gets allocated. With, again, limited, limited exceptions. Yeah. So what's going on now? I just want to understand. Basically, again, my understanding, at, you know, according to the, the Federalist Papers and the Constitution, is that the, the Congress, the legislative branch, has the the, um, the responsibility to be the checks and balances of the Supreme Court as well as the, the executive. <coughs> Yes. Regardless of whether you define the cabinet or EPA or as a minor officer or a major officer, it will, being as part of the executive branch, it falls to Congress to have oversight over those individuals. So my question is, I might be getting ahead of myself, how are um, people now saying they're not going to, um, they're not going to comply with subpoenas to Congress and everything like that because they're in the executive branch? Is that a violation of the Constitution? <laughs> I think you'll find, although I may be wrong about this, um, I think you'll find that they are all in the executive office of the president. And in the executive office of the president, as presidential advisors, direct presidential advisors, they get the executive privilege in the, in the strong way. If they were administrator of the EPA... Mm -mm. I, back and forth over the well, one, I'll, I'll say I doubt it, um, but um, during the Reagan administration, um, there was a decision that deprived Congress of an authority it was claiming to, by legislative veto, uh, disapprove some executive actions. Uh, and at the time, um, appropriations bills were just quite general appropriations bills, but they came with a lot of legislative history that said how the, appoint, how the uh, um, uh, committees uh, thought this money ought to be spent in some detail. 
And um, the then director of OMB, James Miller, um, said, well, but this is legislative history, and uh, you haven't got a legislative veto, so we don't have to pay any attention to it. And the appointments committee, and, and the, sorry, the uh, uh, appropriations committee, uh, committees uh, said, you sure you want to do this, Mr. Miller? Uh, next, next budget, please, you will submit in precise detail, if you wish us to act on it, you will submit in precise detail everything that you would prefer to go in the legislative history. To which Miller responded, oh, well, okay. But now, one thing that I can say up front, maybe actually it isn't anywhere on the slide list, except, so here's, here's, a, um, here's a graphic that I regularly use in teaching administrative law. And you'll notice that it doesn't make any difference between EPA and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission when I worked where I worked, same graphic. And <clears throat> for both of them, a necessary relationship to the president. At the time, that was um, academic folly on my part. Um, but in a relatively recent decision, the Supreme Court has made clear, as it should properly have made clear, that the independent regulatory commissions are elements of the executive branch. And what differentiates them from the others is that Congress has chosen to say that their members served fixed terms of office and can be removed from office by the president, only the president could do it, only for cause. And one case that has just been taken by the Supreme Court for certiorari uh, involves an agency where Congress has done that for a single administrator, like the Social Security Administration, or in this case, the Consumer Finance Protection Board. Is that constitutional? Can Congress say you have a single administrator who can only be removed for cause? Well, the Supreme Court's going to decide that. If Strauss were deciding that, Strauss would say, sure. The Constitution doesn't say anything about the president's removal. The head of the EPA remains in a relationship, must remain in a relationship with the president. But if Congress chose to say that the only person who can be appointed must be an environmentalist, or the only person who can be appointed as an attorney general must be an attorney, um, yeah, they could do that. And if they chose to say, this person can only be removed for cause, mostly they could do that. And, and now doing this does take me uh, out, of, uh, out of my slide uh, order. I'm going to slide 28. Before you go into another, just yeah. on, on the point that you were explaining about the role of the executive taken into account your experience, do you feel that the advice and consent that is supposed to be exercised by the Senate has been lacked to this presidency because of the fact that they have control of the Senate? Of course. <laughs> that happens. The promises are not always made. Uh, and so that potential tension does not always exist. Uh, I think the political cost that a president would face for deciding to remove someone from office could be there even so and uh, would operate as some level of constraint on his or her decision to remove this person from office, which is an undoubted authority he has. And now, are there limits on Congress's, where I was going, are there limits on Congress's capacity to say, um, well, this person has to be someone who serves at will? In the most famous of the early decisions of the Supreme Court, 
Um, uh, Chief Justice Marshall, a case called Marbury versus Madison that sometimes takes up four weeks in the teaching of constitutional law, um, wrote that um, whatever may be entertained of the manner in which executive discretion may be used, still there exists and can exist no power to control that discretion. The subjects are political. This officer is to conform precisely to the will of the president. He is the mere organ by whom that will is communicated. The acts of such an officer can never be examinable in courts. And the Secretary of Defense, let's say, the Secretary of State, is such an officer. Secretary of State was the one involved in that opinion. And so I would say, and there's an opinion of Justice White back in the day making the same point, Secretary of State is not someone that Congress could put in office for one for a, for a, a term of years removable only for cause, because he fits that description. That that uh, that description. His acts fit that description of what in class I refer to as discretion. Okay, but there are a lot of other statutes that confer discretion. For example, the statute that confers discretion on the administrator of the EPA to adopt regulations that say just how sulfur dioxide may be emitted to the atmosphere by coal plants. Not the kind of thing that Congress can do, okay? And that form of discretion is regularly and intensely controlled by courts and indeed Chief Judge Harold Leventhal, for my colleague over here, had the privilege of, of clerking when he was, he and I were both considerably younger, um, wrote in a, in a sentence that really is one of my favorites, that Congress has been willing, has been willing to delegate its legislative powers, that is the power to make regulations that have the force of law broadly, and courts have upheld those delegations because there is court review. Because there is court review. It's not, can never be examinable by the courts. This only happens and only can happen when there is court review. Okay? So, um, discretion and discretion. My course is about discretion and, 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 and not the other form of it. And, um, so the agency, if it's the State Department, the relationship to the courts basically doesn't exist, only in the narrowest of circumstances. But whether you're an independent regulatory commission or an executive body like the EPA or the Department of Labor, you are, your form looks like this, and you are in necessary relationships with the president as well as Congress and the courts. And the issue is, well, what's the nature of those relationships? Uh, and again, for me, the opinion, the, the power to demand the opinion in writing about how you're going to exercise the duties that you have is a signal of what that relationship with the president is in most cases. Jean. So are, are you saying that Oh, they could to use line item control if they if they wanted to, and if the OMB forced them to. But there's uh, an unstated treaty between the ap appropriations committees and OMB that okay, you know, go on ahead and make this legislative history, and we'll do what you want, because the political alternative is just uh, unacceptable. So, so and but but, but, but the ju so that means that justice that the legal Branch, right. The judiciary and the executive seem to have a disproportionate power here compared to the Congress. Is that, am I misreading it? Um, well, the Congress is also in charge of legislating, if they can get the yes. president's yes. agreement, uh, and appropriations. Um, 
you know, uh, once a year, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission had to decide how much money it needed for its activities the next year. Uh, and um, that got passed under the nose of the OMB, uh, under the nose of the White House, but Congress had to act on it. And if they weren't willing to act on it, we weren't going to get that money. And also, if something happened, leaky steam generator tubes uh, out at some nuclear power plant. Oh, we want the chair, we want the commission up here to talk to us about what's going on at, any of you know about Indian Point? Okay, about what's going on at Indian Point. And that congressional authority, it's not legislating, but it is overseeing, and we couldn't refuse that. The EPA administrator cannot refuse that, and that too has an impact on how you do your business. It has an impact, first, in your desire to avoid the event, and second, in the way it consumes your resources. Uh, when Robert Pollard uh, made his expose back before, probably some of us at least don't remember it, um, about leaky steam generator tubes at Indian Point, 2,000 man hours, person hours, spent preparing the, and those were 2,000 hours we didn't have for other things. So no, the congressional purchase is, is considerable. Okay, so, how are we doing? 12, 15, I have, we have till one? I, I, I will, I could stop here and just ask for questions. You've only gotten to slide seven so far, or slide eight, sorry. So, um, here are some broader tendencies in the world. I'm not, I'll, I'll just read these and then people have questions while I'm looking at the screen. Shout and I'll stop. Uh, in the world, there's a trend towards increasing executive control by single willful leaders. It's not just here. Fueled by domestic unrest, income inequalities, the impacts of climate change, the flow of refugees, and the use of hidden digital age laws. Any of those inapplicable here? Uh, any of those inapplicable here? There's Harvard University has uh, begun publishing a series of really dreadful, pessimistic books. Um, I give you the. <laughs> I, I, I give you uh, the title of one of the most fearful ones, which builds on, on, uh, on these trends, How Democracies Die. Uh, but there's also the appropriately named Elizabeth Scarry, um, Our Thermonuclear Monarchy, uh, and uh, more recently, Graham Allison, Destined for War, Can China and America Avoid Thucydides' Trap? Um, and um, another Harvard professor, Kenneth Shepsley, has been recently part of a uh, paper about, the, in effect, taking the position that executive absolutism is inevitable. Uh, now, he takes, that, he takes that in relation to courts and not legislatures. So he says, well, maybe legislatures. We're not talking about those. But as between the president and the court, the different nature of the way in which they act, and the president's power over who gets to be a justice of the Supreme Court, um, tend to ratify, I think, uh, 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 Shepley's uh, view. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, the one just now? Yeah. Okay, so that's slide nine. So in that four-line paragraph on the trend, there's a causal relationship in the word fuel. Uh, why is it fueled that way? Why not fuel the other way? What gives you the causality that these problems, which are serious and have no known answer, fuel the, the executive willful leader outcome? rather than the executive willful leader outcome fuels climate change, lower refugees. No, 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 it's the way you put it. 
It's the way you just put it. Those six things are <laughs> driving forces in the trend towards increasing executive control. And my question Why? is, what about the other direction? Yeah. Yeah. What about the other where, what about, where does Where does increasing executive let, control let, come let, from? So predicate we don't know, but predicate that there is a positive feedback loop when strong men run countries as big as Russia and, and Turkey, then other strong And countries. Hungary and, and Poland exactly. and the United States so and Argentina that, and Brazil. Be, and yes. So leave that to be the worst case that's the baseline human behavior, and we escaped it for a couple of hundred years, and now we're back to it. And these are the consequences of that, not the cause of that. They aren't the necessary consequences of that. Uh, the domestic unrest is not a necessary consequence of that. Con income inequality is not a necessary. I mean, one of the one of the ways of maybe addressing the issue of which which is the direction is to remark, as I heard the other day, that the level of income inequality in the United States has not been seen since the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you go back to your, um, your diagram, what you didn't speak at all about was you had the agencies going off in two directions, one to the, the, the general press and the other to the, the trade press. Right. And Who, who, who knows how that's going to end up and what the consequences of the digital age uh, are or will be is, is certainly open. But there, there are many people who see, and I'm not remembering just which of these slides it's on, who see the, it's, one has not only the Arab Spring, uh, who see the existence of smartphones uh, and one's digital choices about just which news am I going to pay attention to as a driving force in polarization and uh, as a means by which um, uh, those people um, ob obtain, um, obtain some control. So dramatic increases. We could argue about that. So. Income inequality is very high. Um, uh, white working class men show class anger as other classes rise. And that's, if you like, a domestic example of the issue that Allison is dealing with in uh, Destined for War. Uh, there, his, his thesis is, well, we're in the Amer we were in the American <laughs> century. We're now in the Chinese century. Thucydides' trap is the war that happens when dominant civilizations see another one rising to contest them. And, and that's the trap we're in, in terms of war with China, and how do we get out of it? But rising classes and previously dominant class in the domestic context suggest similar kinds of issues. And then there, there it is. The digital age is permits us to choose how to get our news politically manipulated. And the two sides in this state seem unable to hear each other. Uh, and in Congress, as well as, uh, as well as on the streets. And then we don't have a parliamentary system. Um, uh, Lloyd Cutler, decades ago, uh, wrote, oh my word, shouldn't we, wouldn't we be better off with a parliamentary system? Well, if you look at England today, you might think not. Uh, uh, but uh, because president and legislature are not unified, it's easy to get in the way of primary legislation. Um, uh, uh, Ornstein and Mass and, and um, have have a, a couple of books that start. Man, have a couple of books. The first one was called uh, The Broken Branch, about Congress. Um, the second one was 
it's worse than it seems, and uh, also about polarization in Congress. And the second edition of the second book is entitled, It's Worse Than It Was. <laughs> uh, so a consequence of this is that secondary legislation, that is to say regulations, is produced by the executive alone, by the agencies. It's EPA that produces the bulk of law involving the environment. In a parliamentary system, neither secondary legislation nor primary legislation happens without the will, one could say, of the prime minister, but I'll say of the whole cabinet. There's a collective responsibility as well as the political responsibility between, direct political responsibility between executive and legislature that does not exist here. Within our executive, there's no real collective responsibility. It's the president alone who controls all cabinet appointments and within the cabinet, the tenure of all those uh, within those offices. Um, so six factors that have contributed to seeing the president as commander of our domestic government. One is the conservative turn uh, because the constitution vests the executive power in a single president, he has to have the right to control such action, and the press has taken this up. So it often reports what are in fact presidential requests to agencies, as if the result had already happened. There are examples from the Obama administration, there's this rather dramatic one <clears throat> from the Trump administration, from the Los Angeles Times, which is a pretty good paper, they ought to know better. The New York Times does the same thing. Trump plans to revoke a key California in, uh, environmental power. He's, he is expected to revoke a decades old rule. He can't. It's the Environmental Protection Agency that can do that. And further on in the article it says, oh yes, the Environmental Protection Agency, which will formal, formally make the announcement. No, not formally make the announcement, which must, as a legal matter, if it's going to happen, do this. The administrator has to put his signature on it. If she doesn't, it doesn't happen. Is expected to announce it while he's in California for a, uh, a fundraising trip. Um, and then, oh, sorry, where, 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 where did I mean, mean to go? Uh, so that's why lawsuits against the agency are always directed. It's the agency, not the president. Okay. Second factor is the increasing importance of rulemaking, uh, which is strictly an executive branch activity, and it really only became important since about 1960, uh, as an the late 60s, as an executive branch activity, as Congress began enacting a raft of statutes: uh, the National Highway Safety and Transportation Act from NHTSA, the, oh, the Occupational Safety and Health Act and Mine Safety and Health Act for the Department of Labor, the EPA statutes and the like, which require it. And it is the predominant source of federal law today. And that has resulted in close attention by the courts to the outcomes, but it has also resulted in increasingly stringent executive orders requiring White House participation and assuming White House command. That assumption is more recent. Uh, the uh, Carter and Reagan administrative uh, orders didn't make that assumption. The Clinton order does. Uh, uh, and uh, President Trump's executive orders uh, are even more aggressive uh, in this. Uh, Peter? Yeah. Um, John Marshall gave us a judicial review. Right. 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 No. No. Not, not, not that I'm aware of. They, they quite enjoy it. I, I thought, but, but, <laughs> but it's obviously contrary to their view that it's, if it's not in the Constitution, we don't have to pay attention to it. Oh, what's in the Constitution is that the Constitution is a supreme text, and that's how Marshall got to it. Okay, I mean, we could take 
we could take the four weeks that constitutional law classes do to, 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 to go through that, but uh, okay. Um, so um, there are some numbers. Statutes on the left, regulations on the right that will help you understand um, uh, that issue. Um, then another factor, third factor, the politicization of American agencies that makes them easier to control. Another difference between our system and parliamentary systems. In parliamentary systems, you, you probably all know about Yes Minister, uh, the BBC show from some years ago. Uh, but in parliamentary systems, the civil service, the lifetime appointees, layer, it, it, it's really thick and it goes really high as it did in the United States until relatively recently. Uh, during the Carter administration, believing that he was performing civil service reform, uh, President Carter, uh, I think he engendered, he at least approved a, a civil service reform that created something called the Senior Executive Service. The consequence of which is that anyone with real authority in the civil service is now subject to political controls and political incentives to an extent that was never before there. And Congress has also been thickening the layer of those, not principal officers, but those inferior officers whose appointment can be put into the charge of heads of departments or the courts or the president alone, and often the president alone. And if the president alone has made your appointment without the need for the Senate's approval, like the actings, you don't have any kind of political responsibility to, um, to the Congress. And, and you might have a, an ambitious relationship with the president. And Trump has said again and again that he prefers acting officials over confirmed officials because their loyalty is going to be a lot easier to enforce, particularly if they're ambitious for the position in which they are currently just acting. So can the Congress undo any of this? Uh, well, if we had such a Congress. Well, but let's, say, let's say we did have a Congress with that. They could, they could restore a civil service that is actually a civil service. They could take positions that are presidential appointments without congressional approval and either make them subject to congressional approval or done by the heads of departments who might be somewhat independent. But that's, that's what they'd have to do. Fourth is the increasing, already referred to in a way, size and opacity of the presidential office created with six advisors and a promise that they would do nothing but talk to the president. They would have no authority. And if you were looking for judicial control over this kind of development, you just, you know, President Obama appointed Lega Kagan, whose presidential administration celebrated the growth of executive authority. And th this work is done behind closed doors and mostly unconfirmed, as I said before. Then there's the impact of digital age tools. If you think information is power, then you have to think that in the paper age there was a lot of power in the rulemaking agencies because that's where all the information was on paper in limited copies, hard for the White House to know, to get, to see. But it's all on the cloud now. The White House is just as able to see it as the desk officers in the agencies, and that effectively reduces the agency's information advantage. And then the executive orders, since Clinton, have taken the position that I can't find a statute to support, that agencies do not have the authority to get their rules published, which they must be, in order to have legal effect without the president's approval. So he has taken on himself, Clinton took on himself, and the others have enthusiastically ratified um, a, um, an executive veto. 
Uh, and finally, there's the impact of legislative paralysis, um, which we know we were happy when President Obama, I think probably most of us were happy when President Obama uh, used DACA and DAPA to uh, deal with the situation he confronted when he couldn't get bipartisan legislative reform of the immigration law done. And maybe that's even DACA is bad. Uh, and here's that other quote from Jackson. This is from the end of his opinion. Uh, if not good law, there was worldly wisdom in the maxim attributed to Napoleon that the tools belong to the man who can use them. We may say that the power to legislate for emergency belongs in the hands of Congress, but only Congress itself can prevent that power from slipping through its fingers. Uh, so, um, Here's an un a uh, unfavorite quote of mine. Uh, this appeared uh, in the Manchester Guardian. Oh, no, some while ago. What am I doing? I thought I was doing 25. Um, this appeared in the Manchester. OK, one of the things I found absolutely thrilling in working for this administration is the president has a knack for keeping the attention of the media and the public focused somewhere else while we do all the work that needs to be done on behalf of the American people. Well, who was it saying that? The uh, deputy administrator of the Bureau of Land Management in the Department of Interior, who was talking to a convention of people interested in drilling for oil off the Atlantic seacoast. That was which administration? This administration. <laughs> 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 but, but the fact that, that, that Bob could ask that question, I mean, it, it, it works two ways, because ultimately everything is politics and, and what the people well, decide to get upset about. Ultimately, everything is politics. So now we got, I promised my colleagues that I would say something about this statue uh, <laughs> that you saw before that's in front of the law school. It's a Jock Lipschitz statue. It was first, um, it, and it symbolically the battle between reason and unreason, which uh, is what law schools are about. So it's a fabulous statue to have in front of a law school. Uh, when it was first in Lipschitz's mind, it was in the early 60s, and uh, Bellerophon, the tamer, was quite large, and Pegasus looked rather weak and puny. Reason was going to win. But the statute wasn't actually produced until 1968, 69. And so it has the dimensions that you see. Pegasus has grown quite a bit. Uh, Bellerophon has shrunk. And if you were to go to the fifth floor in the law school behind the statue and look, you would see that probably for structural reasons, Bellerophon doesn't really have a head. His neck leads directly into Pegasus. That is to say, Pegasus, unreason, is his head. It is our own unreason that we are struggling to contain. And that statement, as a statement for a law school, is utterly wonderful from my perspective. I have colleagues who made the statue and just think it's ugly and it ought to be removed, uh, but uh, uh, not me. Can we be confident that the courts will protect us? Um, I, I wish we could. Um, there are three reasons, at least, why um, they're not uh, very uh, reliable. Um, the first I've already suggested, uh, the, the uh, court's instinct is to avoid absolutes, uh, whereas the uh, executive absolutism would be that. Uh, there'd be a lot of difficulty in bringing lawsuits challenging presidential actions. Uh, in particular, those as concerning his right to command, not just oversee the actions of domestic agencies. And there's the fact that presidents choose who gets nominated for the Supreme Court. And they're unlikely to nominate people, increasingly unlikely to nominate people, who might have a questioning view about the extent of their authority uh, over, um, over government. So I probably 
should end there. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. just curious about what your opinion is about isn't that really more of an affront to the democracy that our framers wanted than what Trump is trying to do and that's all politics and ultimately it comes down to what he's doing should really be stopped in Congress and by the courts but because it is all political and he controls all of those branches at this point that's why he's able to do the things that he's doing one I'm going to maybe just because I teach in a law school I'm going to resist the statement of it's all political. Uh, back, back to the statute, right? There's a, there's a struggle going on. Two, I think there are numbers of folk who think, and I'm, I'm one of them, um, that the willingness to undo filibusters over judicial appointments in the lower courts and the Supreme Court, now maybe over legislation, looks politically advantageous for the day, might be politically advantageous for the day, but then your enemies get hold of it. Uh, and what you have lost, you know, the Senate was thought of as the saucer that will cool the heat, the coffee, hot coffee coming out of the House of, uh, coming out of the House of Representatives. What you have lost is the impulse to moderation that comes from having to command more than a simple majority who might all be of one party. Uh, and uh, so while one understands why the Democrats might say, well, we'll undo the legislative filibuster, I, I, I think that's part of the road to hell uh, that gets paved. But having a question for you inspires me to go back to uh, this slide, um, which um, I mistakenly showed a bit ago. Uh, but want to now, because this now responds, I think, nicely to the view from early times about the president's authority in relation to uh, a, a government. Um, the first attorney general's view, which is the one I hold, uh, Attorney General Wirt, who was the attorney general, I think, for President Monroe, if the laws require a particular officer by name, to perform a duty, not only is that officer bound to perform it, but no other officer can perform it without a violation of the law. And were the president to perform it, he would not only be, be not taking care that the laws were faithfully executed, but he would be violating them himself. That's Strauss's position. The Cushing position has tended to prevail. For laws under which an executive act is by law required to be performed by a given head of department, he's subject to the direction of the president. No head of department can lawfully perform an official act against the will of the president. And that will is by the Constitution to govern the performance of all such acts. He never read the opinion and writing clause, nor do most people who address this issue. I'm distinctly an eccentric. Uh, in my attention to an insistence that the opinion and writing clause, as well as be faithfully executed, uh, has an implication. 
And for me, it's Wirtz implication. And it was also understood by Attorney General when, oops, sorry, not that one. Um, next one. Um, by Attorney General, when he was Attorney General, Roger Taney, who most of you perhaps know uh, through his authorship of the Dred Scott opinion. Um, and he almost didn't get to the Supreme Court. Uh, it, twice, at least during his attorney generalship, he voiced Wirt's view. Uh, there was this issue in the footnote um, where um, there were some jewels of the Princess of, Oran of Orange that ought to have been returned to her, and uh, there was a United States attorney in New York who was the one to be doing the returning. And could the president direct him? Tawney said, no, given the statutes, only accounting officers in the Treasury Department made, could have controlling decisions, subject only to the president's removal power. And then, as Attorney General, he advised President Jackson that Jackson could lawfully direct a, a U.S. attorney to, dis oh, no, that's, sorry, that's the jewels of orange. He, he risked his 1932 election by vetoing a bill reauthorizing the Bank of the United States, but the bank's authority ran to 1836, and by law, government funds were to be kept in it unless the Secretary of the Treasury shall at any time otherwise order and direct. Well, was that <coughs> discretion? Or was that discretion? And the Secretary of Treasury treated it as, as discretion. And when Jackson couldn't persuade Lewis McLean, who was then Secretary of Treasury, to move the funds, he fired him, which is the president's remedy. And his automatic successor was a guy named William Duane. I mean, this is the Saturday ma Night Massacre a century back. And Duane refused. Congress gave me the discretion, and I have to have reasons for it. Surely this contemplates responsibility on my part. So bye-bye, Duane. And now Tawney is appointed as acting secretary, acting secretary. And as acting secretary, he did as the president requested. And th so then... But they were loyal. They, had the, they, they, they may be. So then, one, Tawney is nominated to fill the post. The Senate turns him down. Two, the Senate passes a censure motion against Jackson. Three, when he couldn't get him as Secretary of Treasury, Tawney nominated him for a position as Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. No go. Rejected. Then there was a new election, and senators favorable to Jackson's views were elected. And now the chief justiceship came, became open, and Tawney was nominated to be chief justice, and that nomination was confirmed, and you know the rest. Um, I, I, I have my doubts. I hope, I share the hope. Uh, I share the hope, but um, partly because in order to take things back, Congress has to get the president to agree. Right? There's that, there's that veto. There's that veto. Well, but that wasn't a problem then. Uh, so you, you have to have a very large majorities in House and Senate that are in House and Senate that are willing to oppose the president on this issue at that time. And the other thing that really makes me uh, skeptical about it is uh, is this slide, right? Regulations are going to remain the principal source of law of federal law not statutes. And that's just an executive activity. 
Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I, I want you to get a little bit into executive privilege because um, I'd like to know what are the current rules, not those asserted by the president today, but the current rules about executive privilege. For example, who can assert it? When can they assert it? And for example, uh, are there exceptions to it? And what does it really protect? And more, most importantly, does it protect a particular conversation, or can it be uh, can it be asserted in a blanket way to prevent somebody from testifying? Um, so the first thing to say is that I haven't gone to the statutes, so I I don't know whether that statute that came before me in 1975 was enacted or not. But there are at least three forms of executive privilege that I can imagine. Two of them are dealt with in the Freedom of Information Act, could be called executive privilege. National secrets, the, 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 the stuff that of classified information. Um, if, if that issue is asserted in response to a Freedom of Information Act request, the courts are extremely generous in acknowledging the correctness of the assertion. A looser form of what might be described as executive privilege has to do with the conversation that occur within any given agency about what are we going to do? What should we plan on doing next year? Um, how should we address this issue of policy? So forth. All of those or conversations with one's lawyers, all of those could be regarded as having a form of executive privilege which is recognized by the Freedom of Information Act in a much weaker way, subject to much more intense control by the courts when, no, we don't have to disclose this conversation is asserted. In response to, and uh, the Freedom of Information Act is a very simple statue at the top. It says, well, if you, 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 for whatever reason, want information in government hands, you are obliged only to file a request indicating the information that you want in sufficient precision for the agency to identify it. And then the agency must disclose it to you in a relatively short period of time, unless it has one of these eight reasons for not disclosing it to you. One is classified information, another, this second weaker form, pre-decisional information. So those are, if you like, forms of executive privilege. The third form is um, conversations with the president. I think, the, you know, with the executive. And again, I don't know that the statute was enacted that required the president himself to assert it. But within, I, I suppose, seeing the behavior of national security advisors and the like, that perhaps it wasn't. Conversations within the White House itself, Congress is not going to be able to command. The written opinion of the administrator of EPA that he's obliged to give the president about how he's going to exercise this duty that he has, or conversations that he might have over the telephone or email about that, I would pretty <coughs> confidently expect that they would be regarded as under executive privilege. Because, you know, why, requ why require the consultation if it can't be an effective consultation? President Truman at one point remarked that he really relied on the advice of those who worked with him. But if he knew it was going to be given in public, he couldn't trust it. 
And, you know, that's the other side, always. Peter, I wish you hadn't brought up Thucydides' trap. It's going <laughs> to interfere with my sleep for the next several days. <laughs> The, last t the, the first time I really paid attention to it was during the Cold War, when many people, experts, said, well, now we can see the emergence of the Soviet Union and the decline of America, and we're going to see that trap exercise, and the Soviet Union will be the nation of the 20, 20th or 21st century. And now, of course, we're hearing about China. Oh, we're not just hearing about we're, China. Uh, we see it. Uh, okay. Get Allison's book if for a, you know <laughs> it, it won't put you to sleep. It's a it is it is but, a depressing read. But what I learned about studying or reading about Thucydides' trap is that it's not because one nation beats up the other nation. No, it's that it, one nation implodes and the other nation doesn't implode. And no, no, no. Neither na neither nation survived. Neither Sparta nor Athens. Well, the United States survived over the Soviet Union, and Britain survived over France, and, and, and Spain survived over Portugal. And Allison's and uh, and Allison's book does go through those limited examples. In the the really important one was the transition between the British century, the 19th, and the American century, the 20th, that we didn't fall into Thucydides' trap. And so Allison's book, in fact goes through those examples trying to imagine ways in which we can avoid having the kind of reaction to China's emergence and seizure of the 21st century, which I gotta say seems like a done deal uh, without getting into war. I'd like to have the last question just so we don't have to talk about Thucydides' trap. And, um, you didn't mention the 25th Amendment. and what, Did you mention, I'm sorry, can you say something about how the checks and balances that you've described and how they are actually carried out, in most cases, uh, to strengthen the executive over time? Where is that anomalous notion that the president might, in fact, be seen by Congress to be incompetent? And is that a real possibility? Congress only gets that as a second, on the second shot. What has to happen first is that the cabinet and the vice president agree to refer the issue. Okay, and uh, if the president is in an automobile accident and he's unconscious, that's pretty realistic. Well, I suppose. Thank, thank you very much for um, a, a extremely thought for something, but that was the word I was searching for. For later on, uh, my, my only little thought is that we as human beings think we're in total control and so many things are exogenous factors, some major tsunami, a, a, uh, a flu skipping from all those pigs that are sick in China to us to knock out the, uh, the, the, the young people who work and sustain economies. There's so many externalities that also come into play. and. Um, Rise in sea levels, exactly, and and I, I for one, look at the digital age. I mean, look at all of us. How did we communicate that we're all in the room to talk to one another? And my ch my grandchildren know so much more than I knew when I was their age. I like to think our IQs are about the same, but they are way better informed. And, and uh, teaching digital natives is a kind of challenge that my generation face in a difficult way. Right, my, my granddaughter just produced 60 kids at this environmental thing, and when, oh. when we were in, in the 19, <laughs> and, and, the, and the nine, no, not personally, she brought, <laughs> but when we, but if you remember the 1960s, it was really hard to get 60 people to come together at a, at a demonstration. So let's end, let's end on a positive note. Thank you so much for coming. Okay.